today's webinar. All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, webinar series at Saunsil 2021. First of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to all the participants that already joined today's webinar and also to all presenters that uh, prepared their best, their best for today's webinar. Second of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Amalia Muldani, as your moderator for today's webinar. And then I would like to introduce you to the theme of today's webinar, which is Word English is bring the word to me and bring me to the word with English. Okay, before we start, let's say basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So we hope that today's webinar is going well. Okay, before the speakers deliver their materials, I would like to uh, read some regulations or rules that all, part or part all participants uh, should be obeyed. Thank you. Okay, now the first uh, rule is all activities must be delivered in English. Second is all participants are expected to take notes because no written materials can be delivered. Third, all participants must turn off the audio during the presentation. The fourth is the presentation will be held for five minutes for each presenter. And the last, the Q&A session will be held after the presentation is over. But uh, all participants, you may start asking your question uh, during the presentation or when the presentation is begin, but you can type your question in the chat box. And then after the presentation is over, I will uh, read it and ask to the presenter. But if the time is still sufficient, you can raise your hand and ask your question directly to the speakers. All right. Um, for today's webinar, we have 12 great presenters that will bring uh, different materials um, and different insight for all of us. Okay, now without any further ado, now let's start to our first presenter. We have Kak Zahar al that will uh, bring a theme about the origin of English. For Kak Zahara, time is yours. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Sarah Lestari. I'm from Sullivan University. First of all, I would like to say thank you to our moderator for hand over this event to me. Before I start it up, let me ask you a question. A question. Does everybody here know the language of origin that become our lingua franca that connect us to the world? If no, that is the right decision to be here with me. So let's go back to thousand years ago where English is really not available in our society because English actually born after many events in the world happened. Next slide, please. The first big event is happened in 55 British century. It's also called the Roman invasions of Britain where the Roman people did their invention in Britain, in the United Kingdom, and then they start spread out the leading language. Next slide, please. Next event is heaven in that time of period. In this time of period, there are two peoples from two groups of people from Germany uh, start their migrations in Britain because they feel like they are came from the same nations. So they decide to get put together in one unity. Now it's well known as the Anglo-Saxon people. Anglo-Saxon people uh, spread out their languages, which is well known as the Old English. Next slide, please. Next even is having the sixth century where there is Saint Augustine start converting people into Christianity. So those who believe in Christian religion, they have to read Bible and the Bible that he wrote from his hometown is written in three languages. It's Latin, Greek, and Hebrew languages. To be able to read the Bibles, 
people who believe in Christian religion, they have to learn the language first. Next slide, please. In this time of period, there are basic invasion from Scandinavian people, those people who were in Den uh, Denmark, Scotland, and Swedish. Uh, Scandinavian, also well known as Viking. Viking people um, had a big battle war and they start their invasions in Britain. And then after they took over the place, they start spread out Scandinavian languages. But the most important that we have to know is the most well-known Scandinavian languages is called the Old Norse. Next slide, please. In these years, there are people from Northern France, or also well known as Norman people, start their invasions after they had a big battle war in the south coast of Britain, and they won and they took over the place, and they start spread out French languages. That's why a long time ago in Britain, it has seen like this. I am sorry for my French, which is they used to ask me for forgiveness when they spell French language in a wrong way. But nowadays that language, that saying, I mean, has the same level as pardon. Next slide, please. Let's see what other things happen in English development. In this time of period, as we can see in 15th and 16th century, Britain people start exploring the world, looking for herb in other nations. But after that found it, they start colonialism. That colonialism is well known as the British Empire colonialism. During their colonialism, English start entering into every shape of life. As an example is education, politics, and also economics. Nowadays, English is still developed and it doesn't impossible if sometimes English died or sometimes English got replaced by two big languages, what I've told you before, it's French and Germany, um, which I can call as mothers of English because, you know, um, mostly English language was came from that two languages. Okay, next slide, please. Again, please. Yeah, now we are in the end of my slides. Uh, one Joseph Connor say that writing in English is like throwing a mood at all. Okay, that's all for me. I would like to hand over this event to our moderator. I am Zahra Ustadi, and thank you, and go back to the moderator. Thank you, Kak Zahara, for a great start for today's uh, webinar with uh, her presentation. And then after knowing the history of uh, English, now let's get to know how does how did actually English spread all over the world. That materials will be delivered by Kak Lutiani that will bring a theme about how did the English spread. For Kak Lutiani, time is yours. All right. Thank you, Kama. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. English has spread throughout the world and has become an international language. Do you know how English can spread? My name is Lutiani and I will present about how did English spread. Next slide, please. All right, the spread of English. Kaplan 2000 claims that the first groups of settlers from England came to the American continent in search for a new land in which they expected to be able to purify their faith. The other groups of speaking people came to the continent for trading. Starting from this point, English reached the American continent, which then also spread to the south, to the West Indies, and to the southern part of the mainland. English spoken by the black population in these territories was of the same features as that spoken by the slave, spit in the barbarous condition to the Caribbean islands. Next slide, please. 
Next is the spread of English in Australia and New Zealand. Kaplan 2000 also mentioned that English is present in Australia and New Zealand started when prisons in England were overcrowded with convicts and the British rulers needed a new distant place for the freed prisoners. When they set free the convicts, they sent them to the lands. This was done at the first time 20 years after James Cook is arrival in Australia in 1770. Besides, English also spread to other parts of the world through colonization spreading from trading between traders under the East Indies Company or EIC and native people in Asia and Africa. Next slide, please. Next is the spread of English and uh, colonization. According to Kaplan, 2000, the trading changed into colonization when the British rulers supported the traders by sending them soldiers. The major parts of Africa, especially uh, South Africa and Asia, for example, India and Malaysia, were under the direct rule of Britain, making the people to become bilingual. Next. Uh, the spread of English due to American influence. Penny Cook 1994 defined that in the 20th century, the spread of English has continued because of the rising influence of the United States, which became the leading capitalist power. Next slide, please. And the last is the phases of the spread of English according to Cutro 1996. The first phase saw English spread throughout the British Isles, including Wales, Scotland, and Ireland during the 16th and 17th centuries. This was quickly followed by the second phase, wherein English further expanded its realm to North America, Australia, and New Zealand by means of the migrations of English-speaking populations. Cutshaw cited um, that the third phase, the Raj phase, is having the greatest effect on the sociolinguistic profile of English. It was during this phase uh, uh, that English spread to areas where no English speaking communities had previously existed, including South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Southwest, and East Africa. According to Kachuru, this contributed to the rise of major cross linguistic and cross cultural attributes uh, which together resulted in the change profile of English as a pluricentric language. And that's all for me. Thank you. Back to the moderator. Thank you, Kalut Kenny, for a clear uh, presentation. Now we know the history of English and then uh, the, how, the, how does the English spread all over the world. And the next uh, materials is about uh, defining the term of word Englishes that will be delivered by Ka Angira Madani. For Ka Angira, time is yours. Thank you, Kamal, for letting me to deliver my presentation. Hello, can all of you hear my voice? Is my voice clear enough? Yes, Ka, it's clear. It's clear. All right. Good morning, everyone. Have you ever heard the term of world Englishes? Or have you ever noticed why Malaysian or African speak English, which kind of a little bit different? Isn't English only one? Let's talk about this today with me, Angira Madani. Next slide, please. The term of world Englishes appeared about 15 years ago as a reflect when English became the global language. First of all, we have to know what it means by global language. Global language is a situation where a language becomes the international language and all people around the world use as the result of power taking over the world. When we talk about global language, language we only talk about one thing. Yes, the power the power of the people who speak it. Then we call it global because the range of its power extends all the way around the world. Um, then what about English when it becomes the global language? What about global English? Next slide, please.
let's take a look at what the linguists say. Global English is the voices of international capitalism. What does it mean? It means English become the global language because it has power over it. It has power in it. And this power comes from some factors such as military power, economic power, political power, science and technology power, and all of these factors support English language to be globalized and being used by all people around the world and finally become the international language. Can you guess what will happen next? Next slide, please. Since the time English became the international language, many countries adopted English and it being used by its people who have their own history, cultures, traditions, foods, and everything about local interest that only exists in their country. They talk about their local interest using English and finally become the international language as English being used everywhere, every part of the world, this creates varieties. Next slide, please. All varieties of English have been shaped by contact with other languages. As David Crystal said in one of the talk show, he mentioned that world Englishes is an adopted English language and it's influenced by its uh, historical background, cultural background, foods, flora, fauna in their country. Next slide, please. Let's conclude that world Englishes is an adopted English language which um, which influenced by some factors such as uh, military, such as political and um, historical culture, foods, flora and fauna in those country that only exist in their country. Next slide, please. Um, I want to say that world English is, is like an umbrella and this umbrella covers all varieties of English worldwide. So you don't need to be worried about your English because you can bring your English to the world and the world will bring English to you. Slide, please. I put all the materials in here. All right, that's all from me. Thank you. I give it back to the moderator. Thank you, Kak Anggira, for your excellent presentation. Uh, after knowing uh, the new term, which is word Englishes, the next presenter will uh, bring a theme about Kachiru's Rikosatrix Rikas models of word Englishes. But before we uh, go to the next presenter, I would like to remind all the participants that if you have a question already, you can type it on the chat box. And after the whole presentation is over, uh, the Q&A session will be begin. Okay, uh, now let's go to the fourth presenter. We have Kai Elsa Yohanaza. Uh, for Kai Elsa, time is yours. All right, thanks to moderator for giving me time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Elsa Yohaneza. I'm a student of English Education Department of Siliwangi University. Today, I wanna to share one of the most important and influential model for classifying English varieties around the world, which is Kachur's three circle model of world English. Next, please. Okay, this model of world English is proposed by Brad Kachur in 1985 that allocates the presence or the existence of English in terms of three concentric circles. The first is the inner circle, the second is the outer circle, and the third is the expanding circle. 
These circles represent the type of spread, acquisition pattern, and functional domains in which the English language is used across cultures and languages. Next, please. Now let's start with the first circle, which is the inner circle or the smallest circle. Kachru labels this circle as norm providing because the norms of the English language are produced there. This means that this, uh, this places is where uh, linguist, linguistic and cultural basis of English language are created. This circle is made up of the countries who belong to the first diaspora of English. It means that this, this is where the norms of the English language are located and then they spread the language to the other circles. The inner circle represents countries where English is considered as a native language or ENL. So people in this circle or in these countries, they use English as uh, their primary language or their first language in daily life because they were born in English lang native language countries. Because this is the smallest circle of all circles, so uh, the users or the speakers of the inner circle are only about 500 million speakers of ENL. And the countries that belong to this circle includes the UK or Britain, USA, Canada, Australia, Ireland, South Africa, New Zealand, and so on. Next, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The slide is already moved. Um, maybe it is freezing on your screen. Oh, yeah. How about the other? Sure. Uh, is the slide still in the previous or already moved? Okay, uh, oh, maybe uh, I will fix it. Uh, wait a moment, can you wait? How about now? Us. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll continue my presentation. Now let's move on to the second circle, which is the outer circle. Kashru named the circle as norm developing because the contact with other languages and it prompts changes in its vocabulary and sometimes in its grammar. This circle is made up of the countries who belong to the second diaspora of English. It means that uh, the countries or the places in the, in the circle uh, hold historical relation with the British Empire. So they were ever colonized by the British Empire and the language spread through the expansion, the imperial expansion by the British Empire in Asia and Africa. The outer circle represents countries where English is considered as a second language or ESL. So people in this circle uh, do not commonly use English in daily life, but English for them uh, is still important in social, and governmental life. They also learn English almost at the same time as they learn their primary language. Uh, the users of this circle are about uh, 1.2 or 1.3 billion users of ESL. 
They include India, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Pakistan, and many more. Next slide, please. Now, finally, we'll talk about the last circle or the biggest circle, which is the expanding circle. Cultural labels this circle as norm dependent because they are providing or using English as on the standards created by the, the inner circle's native speakers. So uh, in these countries, the countries in this circle, they do not easily uh, create or purchase Englishes, but they uh, only follow the rules that has been provided by the inner and the outer circle. This circle is made up of the countries that were never colonized by the British Empire. And this circle also represents countries where English is considered as a foreign language or EFL. So people in this circle uh, do not commonly use English in daily life or social life, but they uh, learn English in schools, universities, or another uh, academical, academic situation. And the users of this circle are about 2 billion users or speakers of EFL. They include Indonesia, Russia, the Emirates, Japan, China, South Korea, Egypt, Brazil, and many others. That's all from me. Thank you. Back to Kama. Thank you, Ka Elsa, for your excellent presentation. Um, after knowing from Kaelsa's presentation that um, actually English has a very, really very, really diverse all over the world. And then uh, the next presenter will uh, deliver materials about recognizing the variation of English in the world that will be delivered by Karastika Resandi or Karastika, time is yours. Thank you to the moderator for giving me the time to explain my material. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that English is a language that widely spoken in the world. And have you ever wondered, is there, is there any differences of dialect in English? Well, you will find the answer after you uh, uh, see my presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Restika Sandi. Uh, I'm from English Education Department, Siliwang University, and I'd like to tell you about the variations of English in the world. Next, please. According to Torgabe 2007, English language is widely spoken and thought in the world. It is considered a lingua franca, and it is also considered by many people to be the universal and the international language. Next. In this slide, I'd like to explain a little bit about Kachuru Circle. As the previous presenter told you that Bridge Kachuru 1985 presented the varieties of English in a set of circles. Those are inner circle, outer circle, and expanding circle. You can see in the picture, there is Kachuru's three circles of English. The small circle is the inner circle. It consists of the countries such as UK, USA, Australia, and it has 375 million of users. The second one is the green circle. It is the outer circle. It consists of the countries such as India, Jamaica, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and it has 400 million of users. Next, the bigger circle. It is the expanding circle. Eh. <laughs> It is the expanding circle. It consists of the countries such as Italy, Brazil, Russia, China, even Indonesia, and it is it has one billion of users. In fact, the number of non-native speakers in the world is more than native speakers, right? Even the expanding circle has a biggest number of users in the world. Next. Here, the brief explanation about cultural circle. The first one is inner circle. What is inner circle? 
Inner circle is the circle that consists of the countries that English typically and historically associated with as a standard language, and it is considered as the first language. The second one is outer circle. Outer circle is the circle that consists of the countries that adopted English as a second language. And the third one is expanding circle. Expanding circle is the circle that consists of the countries where English spoken as foreign language. Next. Talking about the variations of English, uh, it is related to the differences of English accents in the world, right? Well, I put the example to show you the differences, how to pronounce our sound in the word water uh, between American, British, Indian, and Russian English. Let's see, the first one is American English. For example, can I have a glass of water? The second one is British English. For example, can I have some more? The third one is Indian English. For example, don't drink my water. Don't drink my water. The fourth one is Russian English. For example, put this vada. Put this vada. Next. Besides the differences in pronunciation, there is the differences in English vocabularies between the inner circle countries. Let's see, the first two one is uh, American, the second one is British, and the third one is Australian. The first two one is the word candies. In British, those are sweets, and in Australian, those are lollies. The second word is apartments in British, those are flat and in Australian, those are flat or union. The third one is movie theater. In British, it is cinema or movie and in Australian, it is film. Well, it can be concluded there are many variations of English in the world since it has spread all over the world. And there are the differences uh, in dialect of English, including grammar, pronunciation, vocabulary, etc. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking time to listen to my presentation. Hopefully it is understandable and beneficial for you. Back to the moderator. Thank you, Karastika, uh, for your excellent presentation. Um, well, English is that it has so many variation between uh, countries that has different accent, different uh, vocabulary in there. Okay, now, as we know uh, about red Englishes and stuff, now let's get to know how actually English became a global language that will be explained by Kak Dante. But before uh, we go to Kak Dante's presentation, I would like to remind all participants, you may fill the attendance list, attendance, I mean, uh, that the link is provided in the chat box and the time is until 12.30. Okay, now let's go to uh, the next presenter, which is Dante Rahdian. For Kak Dante, time is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Kak Amal, for your time and opportunities that you gave me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. What a lovely morning it is. Thank you very much for your attendance. Today, I will talk about how English became a global language. My name is Dante Rahdian Maulana, and I'm a student of Siliwang University. Next slide, please. So, when I heard about the word English, I immediately think of the international language or the lingua franca. And here's some fact for you. There are over than 350 million people around the world speaking English as their first language and more than 430 million people speaking it as their second language. But why? Next slide, please. Why? You see, this question has uh, circling around in, in my mind for a while. Why? Why English? Why not Chinese or Indonesian? Why English is everywhere? Why there are so many people speaking English? Why there are so, there are so many people studying it? So many whys, so many questions. But I hope uh, by the end of this presentation, uh, we can answer it properly. Next slide, please. 
A researcher named David Northup uh, said this, English became the predominant language in the British Isles, overcoming such rivals such as Cornish, Wales, and Gaelic. And then he, th he, and then he looks at how English spread throughout the British colonies that eventually became the United States and the Canada. Back then, when the colonization era was popular among the superpower nations, such as uh, the British Empire, the French, the Spain, Portugal, you name it, um, they are traveling around the world seeking for glory, money, and resources. Also, Northup analyzed the culminating phase of the globalization of the English uh, and, and rise to its current uh, status as a lingua franca of this modern world. Next slide, please. As you see now, I collected some data that determine English like it is right now. Uh, the first one is they are married to the rock local and spread their culture, including languages, accidentally. And then they are established uh, settlements uh, around the late of 16th centuries and established lots and lots of settlements in the North, Amer North America, uh, the West Indies, and by 1670, uh, there were British American colonies in New England, Virginia, Maryland, etc. Because we all know that uh, the British Empire has a very strong Navy fleet. Even the French are afraid of it uh, if they want to engage in a battle at the sea. So that's why they established so many est establishments um, uh, back then in the 16th centuries. Also, uh, if you see, Jamaica was obtained by conquest in 1655, which means they are at war with, with each other. Uh, and then the Hudson Com Bay Company established itself uh, in what became the Northwestern Canada from the 1670s. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to answer the question that I've mentioned in the previous slides, why English? because it's the power. I want to highlight the power here. The power of the British Empire that gave them so much influence uh, to another country that has been invaded by them. I was wondering if, just if, let's think together, if the Indonesian had their power like the British Empire or more in the past, it might be that Bahasa Indonesia will thrive and became the lingua franca but obviously it didn't happen. So uh, we don't have the power to do it anyway. And uh, English was uh, initially based on political and military factors only, most notably by the conquest. I mean, the, the expansion of the British empire back then. And then later the role of English as language of the scientific, industrial, financial and economic revolution further increased its influence. Thank you, thank you very much for your lovely attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back to you, Kama. Thank you, Kak Dante, for your amazing presentation. Now we get to know that uh, the power that English has uh, to be a global language. And then the next material is about um, the role of English as a global language that will be delivered by Kak Ilma Khairanisa. But before that, um, I would like to remind all of you, if you have some things that still stumble in your mind, you can ask a question, but type it in the chat box. Okay, uh, for Kailma, now time is yours. Um, thanks to Kama who has given me a chance to do the presentation. Well, good day, everybody. I'm Ilma Khonislaiwani. Right now, I'm going to share the fruitful material about the role of English as a global language. English is said to be the first global language as it is massively widely used in the world. For example, in like uh, international uh, department or messenger time and scientific publication, uh, magazine publication, and also other books. As English is a global language, most of the native and non-native speakers of English are using English as their mode of communication as it is occupied by connecting the people among countries and west, south, east, and north. Well, to make it clear, next slide please, Rao, 
2019 on his research divided the role of English as a global language into several aspects such as science and technology, education, employment, business, the internet, travel and tourism, uh, person media, and entertainment. Next slide, please. Well, let's start with the first point, science and technology. It is known that the fact English plays a dominant role in the field of science and technology. Uh, Rao 2019 argued that more than 80% of all scientific journal articles in 1998 were indexed by chemical abstract, and these were written only in English. As we can see here, the percentage that English plays uh, the predominant among the languages as the evidence that English uh, play predominant role in the field of science and technology. Second is education. It is known that English plays a dominant role in the field of education all over the world. Rao 2019 argued that most of the books of higher education are written in, in, in English. Um, nowadays, also, the many of students would prefer go to study abroad in foreign country, which is required to the English ability uh, where they want to uh, promote their uh, ability and um, to promote uh, their field. And also, uh, English here can be the great asset for them. Number three is employment. Um, around 2019, said that another advantage of learning English is getting employment as more subject job provider as for the language skills, especially communication skill in English. Um, because uh, whenever since the internet since the companies dealing with the international companies and the job provider also asks if the candidates uh, have the ability in the communication because it is useful whenever they want to do it. They express uh, ideas and uh, even if they have the higher qualification educational, educational qualification. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next is business. Uh, in the modern business world, English is widely used in the uh, international business, international trade, and commerce. According to Gradle 1997, about 80% people use English while they are in Europe. Not only in Europe, it is also used in a global business, which is happening under the control of World Trade Organization. And next is about the internet. Um, English as an international language with an advent of the internet as the mode of fast communication um, has bring the has brought the changes, the tremendous changes in this age of globalization. According to Rao 2019, the majority of 56% of the internet the internet sites are designed in English. It is evident that English is even used to design the website and also to browse the internet. Next is travel and tourism. All the departments uh, in travel and tourism are using English as their primary language. Whenever somebody who want to uh, who, have, who want to travel to another country, that but that people have to know the language spoken in that country. So. Uh, Route 2019 argued that English as an international language served the purpose in travel and tourism. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> the seventh is press and media. According to Rao uh, 2019, the world leading newspapers, magazine, and most of the news broadcast daily programs on television are mostly in English because a widely language um, by all speakers all over the world. And the last but not least is in uh, the last but not least is entertainment. Like the other fields, English also plays the predominant role the entertainment. Uh are good now 2019 are good that English plays a vital role in promoting entertainment through movie, television, and music industries. In conclusion, that 
uh, English as the international, as the global language is uh, widely globally used in almost field as the main or official language. That's all from me. Thanks for your nice attention. Back to Kama. Thank you, Kailma, for your amazing presentation. Now, after getting to know the role of English as a global language, now you might wondering what are actually the characteristics of English as a global language? That materials will be delivered by Kak Muhammad Azka Devaldi. For Kak Azka, time is yours. Okay, uh, thanks to the moderator Kama who giving me time. And thank you for all participants who are coming today. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to quickly introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Azkarifaldi. I'm a student in English Education Department of Sulawang University. And I am looking forward to talking to you today about characteristics of English as an international language. And I highlight three characteristics of English as an international language. So without any further ado, let's go to the first. Global English. Next slide, please. Yeah. Most people consider English to be a global language because it is the one language that is spoken and understood by the majority of the population in almost every region of the world. So what is global language? Mustin in 2011 on his journal views that while there is no official definition, it uh, uh, refers to a language that is learned and spoken internationally by native and second language speakers. A language is called a global language when it achieves the official position and education preference in every nation that language will fin finally come to be used by more people than any other language. And why English become a global language? Next slide, please. Yeah, according to Crystal in 1997, Gradle in 1997, and Common in 1998, as a global language, of course, English has certain countries where people speak it as a first language, such as USA, Canada, Britain, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and several Caribbean countries are among the 30 territories that use English as the first language. However, English does not gain its special status as a global language merely by being spoken by people in those countries. English becomes a world language because people in other countries give a special credency to English, even though they do not speak it as a first language. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the second is world Englishes. World Englishes means that the different forms and varieties of English used in various sociolinguistic contexts in different parts of the world. So the term of world Englishes refers to the differences in English language that emerge as it used in various contexts across the world. So Catru in 1997 proposed three circles to divide English using world. While doing this, he focused on the historical context of English, the status of the language the fu and the functions in various regions. Okay, uh, according to Kachru, the inner circle refers to the countries uh, where English is used as the primary language, such as uh, the USA, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And second is the outer or middle circle denotes those countries where English usage has some uh, colonial history. This includes uh, nations such as India, Bangladesh, Ghana, Kenya, Malaysia, and so on. And the last is the expanding circle includes countries where English is spoken, but where it does not necessarily have a colonial history or primary or official language status. This includes nations such as China, Japan, South Korea, Egypt, Nepal, and Indonesia. So that is the term of world English is by culture. So uh, next slide, please. And the last is English as a lingua franca, where a language is widely used over a relatively large geographical area as a language of wider communication. It is known as a lingua franca. As David Crystal in 2003 mentioned that in recent years, the term English as li uh, lingua franca or ELF has emerged as a way of referring to communication in English between speakers 
with different first languages, since roughly only one out of every four users of English in the world is a native speaker of the language. Most ELF interactions take place among non-native speakers of English. And the question is, why English become a lingua franca? Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, Philipson in 1992 on his journal believes that the promotion of English worldwide that resulted in English becoming the new lingua franca has many economic, cultural, and social causes. But it is a fact that English has been successfully promoted and has been eagerly adopted in the global linguistic marketplace. So English has become the world's lingua franca is due to the fact that it's the common language or mode of communication that enables people to understand one another regardless of their cultural and ethical backgrounds. It makes uh, communication a lot easier and understanding one another has become efficient. So from these three types of characteristics, it can be concluded that starting from global English, what English is, and the last is English as a lingua franca, it shows that to become an international language requires very strong characteristic, characteristic company. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So uh, next slide. This is my references. And if you have any question, use my uh, email and Instagram ID. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today and go back to the moderator. Thank you, Kazka, for your great presentation about the characteristic of English as a lingua franca. And then the next presenter, which is the ninth presenter, we have Kaberlian Nasiti that will present a material about English as a lingua franca in the context of multilingualism. Time is yours. All right, thank you to Kaama for giving me time to deliver material. My name is Beriana Siti. I'm a student of English Education Department, Suluang University. All right, many of people have known that English has become the global language and it is widely used by so many people around the world. Therefore, in this special occasion, I would like to deliver about English as a lingua franca in multilingual context. Next, please. My presentation will be divided into three parts. Uh, the first one, we will uh, talk about the definition of lingua franca, and then we will talk about English as a the definition of English as a lingua franca, and then ELF is a multilingual phenomenon. Next, please. All right, what is a uh, lingua franca actually? According to Dr. Alaric Hall in 2015, Lingua franca is a language that two people or more speak or communicate with each other, and there is not the native language of both of them. It means when a person talks to one person from another world, uh, they do not use the native language here. Next, please. As, as previous presenter have uh, demonstrated about the definition of English as a lingua franca, then According to Jennifer Jenkins in 2009, English as a lingua franca means English is used as a communication language by people from different L1 backgrounds. And Say the Hofer in 2011 also stated that English here become the only choice for those people to communicate. But it doesn't mean you cannot uh, speak in another language. If you can speak Mandarin and, and someone that you talk to can also speak Mandarin, of course you can use that language. But in this context, in this case, if you meet someone new and you don't know where they are come from and you don't know what languages they are used as their primar primary language, here English becomes the only choice. Uh, for example, uh, someone from Indonesia, that is their first language is Indonesian, speak to someone from South Korea that their first language is Korean, and then they talk to each other and here they are using English, then that is called English as a lingua franca, and here English become the only choice for both of them to speak. Next, please. And now let's talk about the ELF is a multilingual phenomenon. In this multilingual context, Jennifer Jenkins in 2016 demonstrated that ELF is a multilingual phenomenon because the majority of people who use ELF are multilingual. She also stated that ELF is fluid, flexible because 
ELF is a diverse and over 420 million people use English not as their first language. They use English as their second language or as their additional language. Next, please. And Jennifer Jenkins in 2016 also added that here people can be multilingual without using English, but it is difficult to use ELF effectively without being multilingual. It means we can speak in other languages, we can speak so many languages, uh, for example, Spanish, German, or Cantonese without using English. But if you use English as a lingua franca without being multilingual, it will be difficult. For example, if you are from American, of course your first language is American, is English, I mean, and then you speak to someone that is also from America, that their first language is English as well. And you talk to each other, that's not English as a lingua franca, that is just your mother tongue. You speak it as your primary language, you speak it every day. And Canals in 2017 also demonstrated that here, multilingual speakers who can converse in different languages and make creative use of their multilingual and multicultural resources use English as a lingua franca. It means a people who use English as a lingua franca are multilingual speakers, and then they actually can mix the languages when they speak or when they write, uh, probably on their social media and stuff. And last, we have uh, from Bayard at all in 2019 uh, that stated ELF in multilingual context is used as decision making, negotiation, and problem solving language. For instance, in an international conference, people are gathering uh, in the delegates, I mean, from all over the world gathering in a conference, and they, they probably will uh, solve a problem from a country or from some countries that is like the world. Next, please. Well, from what I have demonstrated, can be concluded that ELF in multilingual context means ELF is used by multilingual speakers. It can be used in conversation or even in the wide context, such as decision making, negotiation, and problem solving language. In addition, it can be said that ELF in multilingual context is a multilingual phenomenon because over 420 million people use English not as their first language. Next, please. Here are the references that I used for my material today. Uh, that was all for me. Thank you for such a lovely attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back to moderator. Thank you, Kak Berlian, for your nice presentation. And then after that, we still have a few presenters. And the next presenter is Kak Raihan Aryobimo. <laughs> Raihan Aryobimo Nugroho. That will bring a theme about how lingua franca can change the world. For Kabimo, time is worse. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kamal, for giving me a chance to present this special occasion. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Renard Wimonugroho. I'm from Silogong University. And what I would like to bring this uh, today in this special occasion is how English as a lingua franca can change the world. Next slide, please. Okay, so as what you heard before from uh, Azka Obelian, English as a lingua franca is a term for the use of English to communicate even though speakers or not natives or speak English as their first language. And according to Barbara Seidelhofer in 2005, English as a lingua franca or ELF has emerged as a way of referring to communication in English between speakers with different first languages. Since roughly only one out of every four uses of English in the world is a native speaker of the language. And in this ELF, there are major dimensions. Next slide, please. Well, I have separated the major dimensions into three major dimensions. And according to uh, Molina and Sue in 2018, uh, the first major dimension is ELF refers to an intercultural communicative setting in which speakers from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds use English as the medium of the communication. The second is ELF refers to the various communicative strategies or practices 
that those speakers employ in intercultural communicative contexts. The third is, EOF is a paradigm or an area of inquiry in applied linguistics. And the paradigm that involved in this uh, major dimensions of ELF, there are two of it. The first one is, as English as international law is diversified, so have the users who are predominantly bilinguals, multilinguals, or translinguals, whose English and their plurilingual repertoire are creatively and strategically used. The second is, the term English as a lingua franca doesn't suggest that certain uses of English are included or excluded from communication. Next slide, please. And the questions that I've thrown before in the, uh, what is it title is, here, how does it change the world? Well, I've separated into two different impacts. Uh, the first one is minor impact, and if there is minor impact, of course, there is the major impact. The next slide, please. In the minor impact, I have three minor impacts of ELF. The first one is Roman's life. Most of my friends, and probably uh, including you, the participant, have been forth in Roman's life across the country. Uh, all you have to do is just using the ELF through social media, you can use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or even YouTube through the comments or the chat and the email and some, some other thing like that. And you can be the mistress too. Uh, and the second, actually it has a correlation with uh, Roman's life. It's communication globally. Like, I mean, the goal, like the main goal in communication globally is the connection you can search information with your friends across the country. You can do it through uh, social media and all of platforms or the most happening platform these days, which is Omegle, you can use it as well. The third one is shopping abroad. I've done it in uh, many different times. I've done it in Facebook, Craigslist, or eBay, and you can do that too. The way ELF involves in the shopping abroad is the way or how you contact the seller. You can use ELF in it. Next slide, please. Next slide is a uh, major impact of ELF. I have two major impacts of ELF. The first one is is economic. In ELF, you can use uh, ELF in business thing. You can deal with someone, you can uh, make a contract or anything based on business with ELF. Or if you guys play that is currently trending right now, like uh, crypto or stock, you can consult with your stock, your stock broker in your financial advisor with ELF, you don't have to worry about uh, the grammatical structures or you don't have to worry about the theoretical of English. You can just use ELF. And the next is uh, teaching and learning. And researchers have found that ELF is helping people in their daily life. As Matsura, Chiba, Mahoney and Brilling in 2014 found, different varieties of English could be incorporated into teaching materials and activities. Employing different accents could assist students in gaining confidence in listening and using EOF. Not only in daily life, EOF have a great relevance for English as a foreign language country like Indonesia. And the most important advantage of ELF findings is that they reflect the language habits of ELF speakers, helping teachers assess their student needs, and adjust their teaching methods accordingly. And it can be concluded that ELF is affecting almost everything in this world because English is currently a global language and it's an obvious that ELF changed the world into a better place. Next slide, please. These are the references that I used in this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
And thank you. If you have some questions, if you uh, don't have enough time, you can hit me up on email or IG or my number. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, Kama. Thank you, Kabimo, for your outstanding presentation about <clears throat> how English actually can change the world with as a role of it as a lingua franca. And we still have two presenters. And for the next presenter, which is the 11th, we have Ka Amelia Rahmafadila that will bring a theme in the title, how to inspire preservers in the stages to become the LF aware. For Ka Amel, time is yours. All right, uh, thank you so much to the moderator for giving me the time to speak today. All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Amelia Ramafadila. I am student of English Education Department, Silwan University. So in this beautiful occasion, I will tell you a little bit about how to inspire preservers English language teachers to become ELF aware. Next. All right, I have three topics to cover today. First is what is ELF, second is teachers toward ELF, and third is promoting ELF in class. Next. First of all, what is ELF or English as a lingua franca? Early definition of English as a lingua franca, commonly known as ELF, generally excluded native speakers of English as interaction were restricted to being between members of two or more different lingua culture in English, for none of whom English is a mother tongue. House 1999, page 74. So in a simple term, ELF is an use of English among the speakers with different first languages. As the example has mentioned by previous uh, presenter, Berlian. Next. Okay. Nowadays, how do teachers toward ELF? Unfortunately, teachers are often left uncertain about the route that they should take uh, concerning the use of ELF in their classroom. And to address this uncertainty, according to Sifakis and Bayer 2018, involve a process of engaging with ELF research and developing one's own understanding of the ways in which it can be integrated into one's classroom context through a continuous process of critical reflection, design, implementation, and evaluation of instructional activities that reflect and localize one's interpretation of the ELF construct, page 459. All right. From Sifakis and Bayut, we can conclude there are three easy ways to from an ELF in classroom. Next. First is presentation. Presentation can enhance their creativity language skill. This is done by encouraging students to take initiative think beyond the mind of the textbook and use language creatively, purposefully, and interactively. al Isan al 2010. So in presentation section, uh, the teachers allow students to, uh, what's that, to share to the other friends uh, about what they got about the ELF. And second is discussion. Discussion can help students improve their communication skills by teaching them to express their thought simply and concisely. It also allows students to practice listening to and following what others are thinking, just in 2011. So in discussion, the students not only share their mind about what they got in ELF, but also they study to listen to another's opinion. And third is debate. Mayors and Johns 1993 in Canada 2007 consider the use of debates as a teaching strategy that encourages active learning in the classroom where students are interactively part of the learning process. So in debate, uh, the students 
uh, try to hold their opinion about ELF, about why they, what they got in the previous presentation and the discussion. All right, next. So these three ways is the form that uh, of the active involvement from the students. As Bonwell and Aysen 1991 in Canada 2007 believed that this form of active involvement enabled the students to learn more effectively by actively analyzing, discussing, and also applying content in a meaningful way rather than, uh, rather than by passively absorbing the information or listening to the teacher's explanation. By these uh, three easy ways, uh, we hope that free service English teachers uh, inspire, uh, inspired to become more ELF aware and also to promote ELF in their classroom. And by these three, uh, by these three ways also, by if we done this, we might expect that the teachers become more open-minded and tolerant and also pragmatic about the use of English, and also they become more mindful about the student linguistic ability and also their uh, cultural identities. Next. Okay, these are the references that I use in this presentation. That's all from me. Thank you so much for your nice attention. Back to the moderator. Thank you, Kamel, for your amazing presentation. Um, now we get to know that if you, if some of you are a teacher or even a future teacher or even someone who interested in uh, the theory of education, you know that uh, being aware of ELF uh, is really important as Kamel purposely presented. All right. Now uh, let's go to the last presenter, but of course not the least, we still have Kak Dinda Mutiranova that will bring a theme about uh, <clears throat> the death of English. Is it possible for Kak Dinda? Time is yours. Yeah, all right, thank you so much uh, to Carlo for the opportunity. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very glad to be here in this occasion and meet all of you today because uh, today I would like to talk about our one issue regarding our international language, our lingua franca, and our global language, which is English. And yeah, because I'm the last presenter, and I think it's time to talk about the possible uh, of that of English. Well, let me, Dinda Mutiranova from English Education Department, Siliwangi University, to present about the death of English. Is it possible? Yeah, next slide, please. <coughs> All right. Well, then in 2018, believe that nowadays English is the most commonly used language in the world. And the world itself has recognized English as an international or global language where this is evidenced by the many countries in this hemisphere, of course, besides America and United Kingdom, which make English as the official language for their country or as the national language, for example, like Singapore, Australia, Canada, Philippines, New Zealand, and etc. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And also, finally, that in 2017, about 380 million people in the world spoke English as their mother tongue, and about uh, 744 million speakers use, use English as a second language. And of course, that matter or the position of English that can become the international language cannot be separated from the history where the United States act as a global superpower that has economic, demographic, and political power in the colonial and world war era. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, in this slide, uh, you can see that I have summarized or make uh, points about the history of uh, the reason why English became the international language. So yeah, uh, let's see the first one in 16th century. Well, yeah, in 16th century, England started to ask to place overseas colonies and in the next century, which is in 18th century, the British Empire had, uh, has grown quite widely with uh, colonies in several countries like in India, Africa, Caribbean, Canada, and the country that would become the United States of America. 
and next, in World War I, the United States had become a strong economic power and its role in the war increased its political influence in Europe. And next, in 1992, the British Empire controlled almost a quarter of the earth and about one fifth of the world population. And in the end, after World War II, English began to develop into the main global lingua franca as the United States uh, developed more fully into a world superpower. So yeah, therefore, English is becoming the de facto global lingua franca and then the language of global commerce and then the main language of international diplomacy and then the language of air traffic control and the majority of academic journals. Well, after we talk about the history, I think the importance of English as an international language is now understood. But in this day and age where everything is developing rapidly, some other languages are developing rapidly as well. Yeah, for example, like Mandarin and Spanish. Next slide, please. Yeah, you can see in this slide that a gradle in 2009 observed that these languages, uh, which is Mandarin and Spanish, uh, are booming, booming in terms of not only because their number of speakers, but also because their presence on the internet, their economic uh, importance and also their competition uh, with English in resources. And also rather highlight that the rise of Asian countries such as India and China will have a significant impact uh, of, on the place of English as the only uh, international language. Next slide, please. So yeah, and this is last but not least, uh, Messing in 2011 claims that Mandarin uh, is the second language uh, that uh, is often used in this world that has about 908 million L1 speakers and about 198 million L2 speakers in the world. Well, yeah, where is your position? Is the depth of English possible or not? So yeah, choose your answer. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is my references from my uh, presentation. And I think it's enough. Thank you for your great attention. If there are any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you and back to the moderator. Thank you, Kadinda, for your nice closing presentation for today's webinar. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Now all presenters have presented their materials. Hopefully, uh, everything that has explained before is beneficial for all of us. Amin ya rabbal alamin. Okay, now we go to the next session, which is Q and A or question and answer session. Um, I can see some of question over here. Wait a minute. All right, um, I will read the first question uh, from uh, Zoom Edu or Ms. Arini, probably. Okay. Uh, hi, super exciting discussion. I have a question. After understanding that power is the major influence causing people speak English, does it mean we are colonized by the power holders? As Indonesian youth having strong nationalism, what do you think of it? Okay, because the question is not specifically addressed uh, to the speaker, uh, maybe from the speaker or the presenter who will be who will be the one who answer this question, please. Uh, I will try to answer. I okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the time. Um, thank you very much for the question, ma'am. And uh, I will try to answer it. I think uh, we are not, we are currently not colonized today. And um, if we speak English and we master it, the field of nationalism uh, will not disappear. In fact, we can use it for developing our self skills and it can be useful for uh, our own country. I think that's my answer. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kadante, for your answer. Uh, for uh, Buarin, if you still have, uh, you know, need more elevation, please, you can contact uh, the email that Kadante previously showed in the presentation files. And now uh, we go to the next question from Kak Sheila Iliani. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ashila, for the question, what an interesting topic today. I would like to ask several questions. Firstly, this question is addressed to Dante. As you say that English is influenced by power and responding to Jeng's 20, 2008 statement about language is not a neutral tool for communication. So do you think, is it possible if English construct a complex set of identities and influence how someone perceives themselves and how they see the word. So, uh, Kadante, would you answer the question again? Yes, uh, Kak Amel. Right. Okay, thank you for the time, Kak Amel. Uh, this is a very interesting and difficult question, uh, honestly. Uh, thank you for the question, Shaila, uh, Kak Saila. I want you to understand me uh, here. Uh, I think, okay. When people understand English, they are opening their eyes and mind to the surrounding situation. Because as an individual uh, that uh, masters English, uh, they may know more. And some of the knowledge and popular cultures are written in English. You see, uh, can, you, uh, can you sink that in? <laughs> and um, also, um, different environment and our society that will impact to the perception of seeing the world. Because language is a, a, pop, a powerful concept and it has the ability to completely shape one's personal identity. The usage of the word and phrases significantly, significantly impact uh, individuals, uh, thought and character also personal identity. So that is my answer for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kadante, for your excellent answer. Uh, as Kadante mentioned before, that actually language is one of the, you know, uh, part of the personal identity, which is can be impacted towards uh, the way someone see the word, the way, the way they, you know, perceive the environment and stuff. So hopefully, Kadenta's answer can answer Kaashayla's uh, question, right? Uh, <clears throat> because we have limited time, uh, we will, uh, you know, accept three question. And the last question is for Karasika, still from Kaashayla. Another one is addressed to Resika. In Indonesia, I often times heard someone speaking English with a mix with Indonesian slang. Let's say Jaxal Pride. Uh, do you ever heard about that before? What do you think about it? And you know the dialect accent, even the language itself. For Karastika, would you please answer the question? Okay, thank you for Sheila. Uh, I'd like to uh, try to answer your question, yeah. In Jaksolo, yeah, uh, I, I ever heard before that there is a mix, a mix uh, between Indonesian and English language. And I think it's no problem. It is, there is no problem with dialect and accent, uh, even the language itself, as long as they pronounce the word or the sentence well and correctly. For example, like literally uh, here is panas banget. Uh, literally, uh, as long as you can pronounce the word well and correct, it's no problem. But uh, I ever heard the word jujurly. Mm. Uh, this is, I think uh, there, there is problem in this word, okay? The dialect, especially grammar, Jujur is adjective. 
the ending li is appropriate to uh, what is it? Adverb of manner. I think the word usually is not appropriate. That's all. All right, That's thank all. you, Karastika, for your excellent answer. Yeah, actually, uh, the phenomenon of mixing language, for example, uh, like Jaxal Pride, it is, you know, in sociolinguistic, it, it is called as code switching, which is something that actually exists. You know, the phenomenon is actually all over the world. Even many in nation now, as we expose more to the internet and many things outside the Indonesian and we got to expose to another culture, another, you know, uh, knowledge about other countries. The phenomenon of code switching is pretty normal nowadays and considered, you know, something sophisticated and stuff. Okay, thank you, Karastika, and also thank you to Kasheila for uh, asking the question. Um, I can see so there is still some question, but uh, unfortunately the time is over. Um, you can ask the question uh, to the emails that our presenters previously uh, mentioned before. <clears throat> okay, uh, now all questions have been answered. Hopefully all participants can be understood with the answer as a whole. Now I would like to express my gratitude <clears throat> to, all present, uh, to all presenters as well as the participants that uh, stay in this webinar until the end of the session. Um, thus, the webinar discuss about word, I'm sorry, word English is bring me through the word and bring the word with English is over. Uh, before I close this uh, webinar, I would like to briefly conclude uh, today's materials, which is uh, the spread of English is uh, changes over time, which is started from 55 before century until now. It is still evolving, it's still developing. And then there is so many uh, impacts and effects that it brought to the word because there is a term called word Englishes, which is you know, being an umbrella for uh, the varieties of English that is spread all over the world. And then <clears throat> uh, the impact that English brought to the world is no joke because it is almost, uh, you know, embrace many aspects in our life, which is we can, you know, feel it nowadays since the era is evolving as rapid. And then uh, as a teacher, we have to, you know, aware of it because of uh, future, our future students will be a future generation. So it is important for us if we want to be a teacher or we are a teacher. And then uh, the, the lastly, uh, is it the death of English is possible because uh, there is, you know, other languages that is potentially to cover or to change uh, the role of English as a global language. Is it the answer is in your hands. Okay, now, uh, thank you. I would like to say thank you again <clears throat> for a representer for giving us such amazing information and knowledge. I am Amalia Moldani as a moderator leaf. Thank you so, so much for coming today. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, everyone. Don't forget to fill the attendance list, the attendance, I mean, in the chat box that is provided by our committee. So you can get the certificate for today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. See you in another occasion and opportunity. Now you, you may leave the room. Thank you so much.
Kak Zahra, you may uh, stop the recording probably.